Welcome, um, everybody back here at Siegel Talks at the Martin e. Siegel Theater Center, the Graduate Center CUNY at City University in New York and in, in uh, Manhattan. And it's uh, another day um, on planet Earth and another day in the crisis and the ongoing Corona crisis. And uh, since 14 weeks now, we here at the Siegel Center have been talking to theater artists, uh, performance artists, thinkers, um, around the world about the time of Corona, what it means, how it does feel like, how, what is changing, what has already changed. And uh, of course, theater has been hit so hard, like no other profession was the first to close. It will be the last to open, often be here with, together with massage salons. And uh, it's an uncomfortable uh, closeness uh, somewhere there, but it's a work with the body. I think that's a good um, connection um, um, to it. But the question is, you know, what will happen? We do not know. Broadway officially announced yesterday that they will close till the end of the year, most probably till spring. And the industry is out of work. All the artists, uh, performers, lighting designers, dramaturgs are out, as will be also all the small theaters who we feel close to the experimental downtown places, the Here Art Center, St. Anne's Warehouse, BAM, uh, uh, all of them, the, the Chocolate uh, Factory, the Here Art Center, and Jack in Brooklyn. So it's a disastrous. Uh, people have no income in America. When you lose a job, you have no health insurance. Devastating for artists. Also, the restaurants who often provide works are closed. And things are radically changing. There was supposed to be phase three in New York City. New York City has strictly uh, uh, followed the lockdown much better than Texas, Arizona, and, and other states. So we only had 18 infections last Thursday compared to 1,200 in the big days in May, but still in America, it's uh, scary. What's happening the fourth day in a row with the highest numbers um, um, ever, over 40,000 each day. Yesterday, the Center for Disease Control said it might be 100,000 each day what we will be looking at and everybody knows real numbers are 10 times higher. So <clears throat> it is um, a time we have never experienced before in our lifetimes. And, and uh, uh, so we are uh, really uh, wondering what, uh, what is happening. Everybody says to stay at home at the July 4th weekend, the national holy day, like Bastille Day in France. So it's unprecedented. Um, New York City will not open the restaurants as it was suggested in phase three that 50% capacity would work. People bought food, restaurants, but it's not uh, happening. It's closed. Um, the United Nation, uh, the European Union, um, following also United Nations suggestions, is not opening its borders to most countries of the world, including the US. Uh, even from Rwanda, you can come in, Algeria, but the United States, because of the disastrous politics uh, and uh, the situation here, is not joined. And the US, with Russia and Brazil and others, is uh, uh, is excluded. It's shocking for us, uh, of course, Europeans. and. Um, and, uh, and we, we do not know where it goes. The US just bought up 90% of the world reserves of this remdesivir uh, medicine, the one that potentially has some hope that potentially might put it from 15 days down to 10 days. To produce the pill, it's $5, but the company will charge up to $3,000 um, from the, its customers, from like people, perhaps from the theater world who do so much non-profit work, contribute, but it will say it costs 3,000. So insurance, if you don't have an insurance, then what do you do? Uh, big companies get uh, buyouts, uh, airplane, car company, bi billions of dollars, but a company that seems to be making profit is not required to share it or to do something for the common good. It really exposes in a radical way everything that's wrong. And as Richard Schechner said here on the program, it's the like Fukushima nuclear catastrophe, but the roof uh, is open. We are looking down to it in, in horror, I think um, we um, have to uh, say. So, um, but theater people have been always on the side, as we say, of the uh, struggle, the complex struggle for, for freedom, for liberties, uh, the social justice. And now it's a time, if ever, uh, that we need to listen to our art, to artists who anticipate the future, as Rancière has said, and who often combine an existing tradition um, with a new technology and something new emerges. And Brecht talked about the uh, children of the scientific age for whom he does this either in a way, the mechanical age till at the time, but now we have the children, we have the children of the 
digital age uh, with us and um, and somehow with this catastrophe um, we also seem to be prepared for it. there's zoom and uh, deliveries and uh, so all seems to be uh, be connected and theater artists around the world are looking for new um, ways to deal with this some artists already I think, and we had many of them here, have started their research before experimenting with new works, new forms, understanding that we also need to have a representation of new forms on the stages, in the exhibitions, We at least for a moment, to shake what we already think we know. And with us, we have one of those uh, great artists and also a great uh, researcher. It's uh, Frédéric Aitouati from France. So, uh, Frédéric, first of all, thank you for joining us, and I apologize for my long opening. And, uh, and, uh, and um, before I say a bit about you and your work, where are you right now and what time is it? Well, first of all, thank you very much for your invitation. I'm very happy to be with you. Um, I'm in my office, which is also my bedroom, mm -hmm. uh, which is in this flat in Paris. Um, it's 6 p.m. in Paris. It's the end of the day. It's been a very, very grey day. Uh, and um, I'm very happy to, to have this opportunity to, to discuss with, with you in the other side of the world. And I just want to say that I should have been with you. Uh, so it's very, very moving for me to have this conversation in this exceptional time. Uh, my luggage was ready for New York for I was I had a plane for the 23rd of March uh, and of course on the on the 16th of March I discovered that the everything was closed so um, I feel very close to what you just said also because I'm I've been living in New York in in a way during that that time because it was the plan and everything was organized for me um, so now I'm I'm I mean I'm in Paris, but I'm the same time elsewhere in a way, and that's interesting. Oh, how interesting to be in Paris, but also elsewhere. And um, she was supposed to go to NYU, if I uh, <clears throat> if I remember right. So Friederike is a theater director and a historian, an early modernist, I think 17th century, where you started out, and she explores links between science, literature, and politics. She was at the University of Oxford and of course at the uh, Sciences Po uh, University uh, in Paris and her work. Many, she wrote many books. We have the uh, bio online and um, about the cosmos, about fiction, about uh, the world of the images. And, uh, and uh, she deals with ecological issues. Uh, the Gaia Global Circus, which we will talk about, is something she created. And uh, Le Théâtre des Négociations, the Negotiation Theatre. And many other things, moving Earth, and of course, she's also known for having come with Bruno Latour to New York with the um, Down to Earth uh, project, the lecture performance, how to perform knowledge. And she has been in very big places that uh, we are all impressed, which is uh, Théâtre Montier Armandier, the old uh, Patrice Chirot Theatre, the Lodéon, Centre Pompidou, the Kai, the great Kai Theatre in Brussels at the kitchen, the signature even, and how uh, the Berlin Festspiele in Taipei, and of course, um, much, much, much more. So um, for you, before we start about the world, how did you experience this time? Um, well, first of all, I, I maybe I can say, um, echoing what you just said, um, that I felt um, very deeply that it was a, a catastrophe, a catastrophe for our world, our theatre world, and that everything was suddenly cut and transformed deeply. Um, so as I told you before, I had, like all of us, I had plans. I had a, a, a trip uh, in NYU with my family. Everything was planned. I had a tour that was planned in ZKM in Karlsruhe. I had lots and lots of projects um, on my plate and suddenly everything disappeared. And I, I, I would say that I was very shocked like everybody, but also very moved by the fact that we were all living the same experience at the same time. And maybe this is something, uh, uh, one of the most striking aspect of, of the crisis I, I, uh, I, I won't, 
I would like to remember the, the, the feeling of experiencing something universal and something that we had never experienced before. Uh, I think that's something in, in one's lifetime, that's something that you never forget. There is a before and after. Um, and I'm, as you said, I'm, I'm also a historian and I'm very interested in, in the moment of shift in cosmological changes. Um, I was completely fascinated and I worked for years about this you know, 17th century moment when uh, Galileo, Kepler, Descartes, you know, they, they, they developed the idea of, of a new cosmos, you know, a cosmos where the earth is not at the center, but the sun is at the center. And, and suddenly it means that the world in which you are is different. It means that the world, the earth is moving, is moving around the sun, is moving on itself. So this kind of big, big shift um, I've, I've always been interested in. And suddenly I had the feeling that all the things I normally read about or write about or create plays about, suddenly those things were in our reality. Uh, so it's extremely strong as, as a, a feeling. And all the things I'm interested in, uh, you mentioned that I work with Bruno Latour, so we've been discussing for, for more than 10 years now the, ecology, the ecological crisis and what it means to, to include other beings in, in our mental frame, like, like the, the non-humans, uh, the microorganisms. Um, so we are, Bruno and me, very interested in microbes, you know, in the idea of the microscope and all that. And suddenly all those ideas, um, again, became absolutely concrete and real. Uh, and I, I was, yeah, I, um, it's, it's, um, and it's also very humbling to, to, to realize that uh, um, we, we are so much uh, bodies. We know that we are theater people, but that's the, maybe the third thing that, that, that I would like to, to emphasize, the fact that um, with all our plans and planes and ideas and tools and projects, sometimes we, we, we forget how much we are bodies. Uh, and, and suddenly we were absolutely strongly, deeply, violently reminded of, of, of that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what a reminder it is. Yeah. Um, and, 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 but it was at the same time violent and, and beautiful in a way. That's, that's something that strikes me uh, um, to be confronted with death. This is something that can happen in everybody's life. But to be confronted with death as a species, that's something uh, quite rare. <laughs> And of course, fiction and science fiction and literature and philosophy uh, have discussed that idea of, of, a, of a catastrophe. And, you know, we all have read a lot about the collapsology and the, the idea of the end of the world. And, and the, you know, this is, this is our time. We've been thinking about all that for years, but we haven't been experiencing it yet. Uh, everybody at the same time. And, and one of the very, I think, one of the very strong ex ex experiences that I had during the last months since March is that um, I actually gave my lectures at NYU. Uh, it was not a lecture, lectures, it was seminars. I gave them by Zoom uh, with five PhD students, absolutely brilliant students, um, all over the world because most of them couldn't stay in New York and they had they had to leave. One of them was in Strasbourg actually, one of them was in um, uh, New Jersey and uh, so it was all, all over the, the place, all over the world and uh, it, it was very moving because we didn't know each other, we had never met physically but we, we were very very close. There was a, a strong feeling of bond, I don't know how to express that but because we were just, it was just the beginning of the crisis. It was, you know, 20th, 23rd of, of, of March. So everybody was completely 
dist distressed and struck by, by what was happening. So what I told them, I told them, look, we have to do this seminar together, but we are also a kind of group, completely unexpected group, impossible group in the, in, in, in normally, you know, you, you don't talk to people five hours a week all over the, you know, in, in, in at the other side of the world normally. And suddenly we had this feeling of being like a little group that could help each other. So I suggested them that every time we meet twice, a, twice a week, it was midnight for me because of the time, time zone, we would discuss what was happening to us. And that was very moving because again, it, it was m even more bonding than any other thing like sharing a classroom or whatever. Um, and the topic I had chosen one year ago for my NYU, NYU class was about humans and non-humans. And it was a class in which we were discussing extinction studies, microbes, microorganism, hmm. uh, relationship between animals and humans. And really each class, each discussion was at the same time a, a place for reading and thinking, but also a moment of trying to cope with what was happening to us. Um, with unknown people, you know, and that, I, I think that was a, that was very moving for me, a very strong experience of, of collective thinking, despite what was happening. Mm -hmm. So you really did anticipate uh, that, that moment in a way, it's, uh, <clears throat> it's quite uncanny, you know, to think about that, that this was your theme. I, I don't know if it's, anticipation really um it's it's an interesting question is it uh, as i told you i think it's it's in the zeitgeist it's in the air i mean those questions are in the air um and in a way it's not a surprise that this thing happens to us uh, and and i'm you know so, so some people said in france at the beginning we have people who prepare for the catastrophe. We call them the collapsologue. I, I think you say mm -hmm. collapsologist? Yes, yeah, collapsologist. And, and, and they said, you know, at the beginning of the, of, the, of, the, of the pandemic, they said, oh, we knew it, you know, we have prepared for that. And, and, and it's, it's, a bit, it's a bit quicker than what we show, what, what we thought. It's, it, it comes a bit, you know, too early, but we knew it would happen. And of course, it's not, it's not that it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not the end of the world. It's not, it's not exactly what they're prepared for. And um, so I'm, I'm not sure about really our capacity to anticipate, but I'm very struck by the fact that, uh, yes, in a way, we've been discussing those questions for years. In a way, we are aware of the problems uh, which are, you know, um, emerging now. We know that there is a problem in our relationship between humans and non-humans. We know that uh, it's in the books. It's been in the book for twenty years. Um, we we know that um, uh, we we need to 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 care for uh, uh, th those other living beings who who allow us just to be alive to exist now in the present but also in the long run um, so it's i'm struck by the fact that we knew we knew all that we knew all those questions but um in a way we we they, they were still a bit theoretical and one of those very very powerful thing that's happening now is that it's not theoretical at all it's you mm. know it's everywhere it's we, when we eat something, we have to ask ourselves, where does it come from? We can't just ignore the materiality of our life. <clears throat> uh, so yes, to try to answer your question, I'm not, so, I'm not sure I was anticipating anything, but I was just um, uh, thinking with, my, with, with our time. And, and in a way, um, uh, uh, maybe I was, uh, uh, I was ready to to embrace the uh, the drama 
<laughs> in, in a way. Mm -hmm. In thinking about it, preparing for the seminar or doing the seminar, what did, what did you find? What surprised you? What, what, what was your experience of researching that knowledge? Mm. Um, many, many things. Uh, one of the things I, I, I discovered by rereading uh, one of Bruno Latour's texts called Microbes is that in the 19th century, uh, people faced the kind of situation we are facing now. Um, they had, you know, illnesses everywhere. They didn't know exactly how it was working. They didn't have the medicine for it. They were dying by thousands and thousands of people. The animals were dying as well. And in fact, we have um, we we have been we have forgotten that time. We we were used in the twentieth century to have medicines to have a solution when there is a problem. We were used to you know to be quick to go quickly to the next thing. Um, and what happens with the corona is that we have to stop. We have to slow down, and we are again in this very 19th century and even more before 19th century situation of not knowing what really happens and in terms of history of science this is very striking and frightening and interesting we we don't know exactly what will happen we we don't know exactly what uh, how to solve that uh, we don't have the the vaccine yet and and that never happened. That didn't happen in our world anymore. So yes, rereading Latour, Latour's microbes, reminded me of, of that, of that state, of that situation of not knowing, of not knowing exactly how it works, this virus, you know, all the, the, the scientific articles that we were all reading, you know, uh, trying to understand. And so that's one thing. And the second thing with that book is that it reminded me to what extent we are capable we as humans to forget uh, the non-humans um, and theater is an interesting case for that um, one of the things that fascinates me is the fact that i'm trying to write a book about that at the moment is the moment in the 17th century when the theater of 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 humans and the theater of nature, so to speak, the Théâtre Naturae, were divided. You mentioned the theater of the world, the Théâtre Mundi. The, the theater of the world was much more englobing, you know, it was much more full. The, the, even in Shakespeare, you had, you had lots of plants and animals <laughs> and, and, and gods and, and something happened. I don't know, I don't know if what you think of that, but something happened and and little by little, the, the, the theater of nature became specialized in a way, became the realm of science, of laboratory. And theater of humans uh, became something about psychology and, you know, the relationship of one human with another human on stage. And at least in France, this the big, mm -hmm. this big tradition mm -hmm. of, 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 you know, um, Théâtre classique, classical tragedy, Racine, uh, uh, and then Molière, and it's it's very human. And what I find interesting with the idea um, of doing the history of the microbes, like Latour did, is that he he explained that at some point at the end of the nineteenth century, the microbes microbes entered the stage, the political stage the scientific stage, the economical stage, and of course the domestic stage. And suddenly you have new actors on stage. So this is quite interesting for us, I think, in the theater to try to make the link between, I mean, that's the kind of thing I like to do between history of science and history of theater. The fact that theater is actually a very strong, um, not only metaphor, it's more than a metaphor, a very strong place to think 
uh, about relationship between humans and non-humans. Um, uh, and, and it's also a very strong and powerful place to think about agency. Agency um, in, the, in the broad sense of um, who acts in the world, who is powerful. We have the tendency to think that we are, as humans, powerful. And suddenly there is a tiny, tiny little thingy, not even, a, not even an organism. Not, we're not completely sure that it's alive, the virus. It's interesting. It's some little bits of DNA. You know, it, is it really alive, this thing? We're not really sure. Anyway, there is this little thing um, that completely displaces our ways of thinking, that completely disrupts our life. So it is a strong actor. It has a powerful agency. So yeah, that's another way to answer you. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, but, no, no. Uh, it's, please, the, please go on. This is so significant, uh, what you're saying. So, yeah, so the, the, this book of, of Latour, I'm, I'm talking about it because it's exactly where we met, because he was fascinated by what he calls the theater of proof. He, he interprets science as a theater of proof. And again, theater here doesn't have a, a negative meaning at all. Theater means the place where you make things visible, as we know. Uh, so it's a very... Um, I think it's a very, at least for theater people, for me, it's a very strong way to, to, to understand what happened exactly in, in, the, in, in those years between uh, 1870, 1875. Pasteur created <clears throat> uh, places for visibility, places to make this new actor visible. So of course, what is a place to make an actor visible? It's a theater. Mm -hmm. uh, and 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 there is drama, there is action, and you and you have to show exactly what he does. And the idea that, uh, yeah, on the stage they are much more, or how do you say in English? Yeah, much more actors than only humans. Yeah, yeah. As you said, it was such a big discovery when. In the 17th century, one understood that perhaps Earth is not at the center, it's the sun. Uh, when science entered the European court, said for every young king, you had to be scientifically even engaged. You were encouraged. Scientists were there building instruments and were sharing knowledge. Of course, it went into also military research. And it was also the century of military fortification. But as you said, it was a uh, science and science was significant. And, uh, and the most probably the shock when people could see through a microscope something that was invisible, the bacteria, and, the, and what that really meant, that there's another world we, they, one didn't know about. Uh, there's the great visualization, I think, of data of the cholera outbreak in London, uh, when they didn't know how it worked. Nobody knew. They followed cases, and they did some police detective work to see. And then they said, it must be the water, because they couldn't figure out why were the cases. So they did diagrams and slowly found that as a famous study. And now, of course, the virus, you can't even see on the microscope. It's invisible. Um, so the idea that you are, have been researching with that tool for such a while, I think it is uh, truly significant. And I think for everyone who works in theater and performance, um, something to think about. The idea also to trust in science, to regain trust in science and that theater and the arts and science complement each other in a way that is the search, the absolute search for truth. And even, you know, if in Galileo's way or others, you know, it might endanger life. And also the awe and wonder of, uh, of, um, of such, uh, such discoveries. So, um, but you not only made those conclusions with Bruno Latour and said or wrote an article about it, which already I think is a significant uh, endeavor and uh, to have do academic work. It's a significant work. But you also said, we, I'm a theater director also, next to a scholar, and I'll create, uh, you know, uh, as Amir said, one of our great students, uh, Faroon, together with. Um, 
uh, students at the graduate center they created a performance knowledge uh, series mm. and uh, and which we have done for a couple of years you perform that knowledge tell us about that invention what what you um, what what you created well it depends when i should start the story um, of performing knowledge <laughs> with Latour. Um, maybe I should say something. Maybe first I was doing on the one hand, on the one hand, my, my academic work, my PhD, and I was absolutely fascinated by one of the greatest microscopists of the 17th century called Robert Hooke, who is the one who made the first drawings of oh. microorganism. Mm -hmm. So my PhD is about Hooke and really? the book fiction of the cosmos, there's a big chapter about exactly what you said, uh, describing the invisible. So you, you see, it's a long, long obsession. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was doing that on the one hand, and then I was doing my theater work as a theater director with my company that I created in, at Cambridge, UK. Uh, and it was two separate things. I was, mm -hmm. I was staging Pinter, and you know uh, Racine and Sarot and Beckett and but it was two different things and then what happened is that um, I knew Bruno Latour a little bit already we were friends and he told me look there is something happening we have to make a play about the climate change and you know that was in 2008 or 2009 at that time it was absolutely not fashionable and completely bizarre to suggest such a thing. Mm -hmm. And I told him, are you sure? Play, theater, climate change, what's, what's the point? What are you talking about? Of course, he was completely right. And of course, nowadays, it's absolutely banal, as we know, and even uh, it's a genre, you know, the climate, climate play, it's a, it's a genre, so, but 12 years ago, it was really a, a strange idea. And in fact, it was a complete shift for me in, in, my, in my practice of theater. And suddenly I realized that um, when I was studying hook and the microscope and when I was staging Pinter, actually, I was interested in the same thing. <laughs> I was interested in making the invisible visible. Mm -hmm. um, and there was really no reason to separate those things, except institutional reasons, because in France, it's not a very good idea to be. It's true. Academic. Very and different than in America. It's very, it's very, very red. And also very for different. a female researcher or woman exactly. in it. Yeah, exactly. So you know. I had two different curriculum, you know, and one was hiding the other when I was when I was working in Reims, for instance, you mentioned Reims at the Comédie de Reims. I had a special curriculum that mentioned only theater, but when I was applying for a position, I was mentioning only academia. So it was two different worlds. But in fact, I realized that for me, it was the same strong, deep um, desire to, 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 to say something about the invisible and to show things. Um, so what happened with this climate change play is that we started to work with Bruno and at that time he was uh, discovering himself the idea of Gaia. Uh, he was very interested in, 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 in this concept. He was just starting to, to, to develop this concept. And what I liked very much is that- And Gaia, just for our listeners, she's the Greek goddess Yes. The mother of all mothers of Mother Earth in many cultures and different representations. Who exactly? In Terra in in the Roman. Uh, yeah. Is uh, the Earth? divinity and uh, and she created next to Eros. I think basically the Titans and the world. If is. Yes. So he he discovered her because I also was not so much aware of of, of that. Yeah. He discovered. Shockingly enough, we all yeah. should right. Interesting. Yeah. But he discovered her through Lovelock. So that's important. He discovered the Gaia's hypothesis of James Lovelock. And tell a bit about James Lovelock. I don't know so much about yeah. him. Yeah. James Lovelock is, is a bit of a maverick. I, I think he will be celebrating his 101 
birthday in July, at the end of this month. Uh, is a fantastic and crazy person. I mean, he can listen to us. So I, I, I should be careful and I never yeah. met him. Uh, but uh, he's very fascinating. He's the man, the scientist, so he's a scientist, um, uh, an engineer, for, uh, a scientist and engineer, and he, he decided to be a, a, a free scientist. So he decided to quit academia and to make his own invention and discoveries. Uh, I could speak for hours about Lovelock, mm -hmm. but what I want to say that in around 65, he was working in, in the um, uh, jet propulsion lab in Pasadena in California. Mm -hmm. And he had a kind of vision. He understood because he was working about Mars, the planet Mars, and he understood a difference, a key difference between Mars and the, the Earth. And he, and he had a vision. He, he tells that a lot in his books. He had the vision of the Earth as a living planet, and he had the name Gaia for it. And then he, so what does that mean, Gaia? It's, it's actually a cybernetic concept. It means that the living make the conditions of their life. So it's a kind of circular thing. Basically, the reason why we can exist, we can live, is because there are plants who produce oxygen. And it's also a kind of very, very refined um, loop uh, effect. And it's all the living beings together that explain why a certain quantity of oxygen is in the air. Because if you take the chemical composition of the atmosphere, it should explode, tells Lovelock. I mean, in, in, in pure chemical rules. Uh, and the reason why it actually remains more or less stable, unstably stable, is because of life, because of the presence of the li living. So it was such a strong vision to understand that there is one planet in the solar system, maybe elsewhere, but we know one, which billions, yeah, of billions yeah. and billions and billions exactly. of planets and galaxies. Yeah. And there might be others, but we don't know them. But there is one planet which on which the whole system of air, earth, water is completely actually made by life, constantly made by life. It's it's it is a metaphysically, I think it's it's a very, very strong idea. Um, and, and Lovelock developed that. Uh, with Lynn Margulis, uh, a biologist I will tell you more about later because I'm completely fond about her, her work. But basically, uh, I was telling you the story of, of, of how to create together research and theater, but the, the, the big shift for me, as I told you, is the moment when Latour, because he discovers Gaia, Gaia as I just told you, mm -hmm. he discovered it like as a concept, as a scientific, philosophical, historical concept. Uh, he he, and he was also very interested in 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 the uh, in the climate change crisis. Of course, two thousand and nine. It was the Copenhagen negotiation, a big big catastrophe in terms of international politics. You know, uh, so he was completely into that, and and we started to work together with my company. And it was absolutely great as a process because he was writing his book Facing Gaia at the moment, at, at that moment. So he took us on board on a kind of field work where we met scientists, you know, climatologists, people who were making climate models. We met people who were doing drillings, you know, to, to, to measure exactly the soil and uh, when I say we, it's me and my company. So actors, um, you know, stage director, light person, musicians. Basically, we were we were working with Bruno on on his topic of of Gaia, and and that was as a as a creation process. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, and then the Gaia, the, the result was this Gaia Global Circus show that you <laughs> mentioned earlier that went on tour uh, a bit everywhere. And, and it's not so much uh, a show that was uh, trying to put all the science and all the knowledge we had 
on stage. Actually, after a few months of, of, of rehearsals, I realized that all the science we had uh, learned with Bruno was not to be the topic. The topic was the feeling, the emotion of understanding what happens to us. And we, we, discuss, we discussed a lot with Bruno, what is, what is the role of a theater play at that moment? What can theater do for us when we as humans and researchers and artists are moved by what we discover? What can we do with that? And that was an absolutely fascinating discussion and not finished at all. It's an ongoing discussion. Um, and and the, the, the solution, so to speak, the, 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 the thing or the form we found at that time uh, was to have four actors on stage receiving those, 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 those news, bad news from science, and just, you know, kind of uh, and reacting to them. What, what, what does it do to us? And the second thing I, I, I tried on, on that production, Gaia Global Circus, was to imagine the equivalent of the scientific model on stage. What is the equivalent of the climate model? And I thought, okay, we need to find something with our very simple means of theater, something that reacts to us, which is the definition of Gaia by the philosopher Isabel Stengers, who also inspired us, something that reacts to us, something uh, which has its own momentum, which has its own agency. And again, the question of agency comes back. And I thought, okay, I will imagine a kind of huge puppet with helium balloons, something that can move and that can react to what happens on stage, but also in the audience. So this thing, which was huge, kind of 10 meters on eight, uh, could move in the audience and could actually react. And it was like another actor. So you see, it was in a way, a very naive way to, um, to experiment with this new type of agency. It was a way to say, okay, how do we, how do we receive the idea that we are not alone as actors? Just to go back to the beginning of our discussion, we are not the only actors. There are other actors. And there is this Gaia, this thing, which is uh, not exactly the Earth as an organism. It's more complex than that, as, as, I, uh, uh, as I told you in giving you the definition by Lovelock and Margulis. It's really a, um, a loop, and it's really the, the, the strange loop between uh, life and um, material on, 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 in, uh, on the Earth. So th that was the very first attempt, and for me that was a big big shock to realize that I could do on stage something that was um, also for me research. It was absolutely research and it was absolutely theater. And I didn't need to divide them anymore. Hmm. How interesting and how brilliant and how inspiring. Um... So um, you didn't do what, I mean, we did climate change evenings also at the C Siegel Center, but often we had someone who wrote a play, play, but we, your, your structure was then different, right? Is, was that also already a lecture performance or that circus, or did you have acrobats or the circus? Where, where does the, that come in? Which I believe very much in that popular century old form we also have to return to, but what did that mean to you? And how did you, formally organize it, the text, the actors, the stage? It's a, it's a very good question, this question <clears> of <throat> form, because actually if I tell you after the different um, experiments, I don't have another word, experiments we made with Bruno continuing the process, one striking thing to me is the fact that it was never the same process. It was never the same format. It was ne as if, um, and then I will go back to, to your mm -hmm. question and answer you, but as if it was impossible to have one protocol that you could follow each time um, 
of course, because the questions has changed around the, um, along the years, but also because in a way, I think for me, because this question is so big and it, it's so difficult and, and we haven't answered it yet, I, I, need, I really needed each time to try it, to try to address it from a new angle. So what was this Gaia Global Circus form? It was very, very strange. First of all, it was a text by Bruno called Cosmocolos, which was very much a philosophical dialogue in, in, in the style of Diderot almost with, with kind of philosophical positions. You know, you had, the, you had Lovelock, you had um, the, the, the climate skeptics, you had uh, Clive Hamilton who was writing a book called Requiem for Species, you know, you had those climate scientists and they were all playing together. And this Cosmocolos play, uh, I, I said to Bruno and he agreed that it's not possible to stage it. It's too much of, you know, position voices, so to speak. So we decided to go on stage with my actors uh, we were two companies, my actors and Chloe Latour's company. We put them on stage and we said, okay, we have to, we have to, to invent, um, to Im improvise, in actually to tackle that question. So we improvised a lot about Gaia entering, about the different emotions that were um, uh, the result of those terrible scientific news. And then we asked a, a writer, actually, Pierre Dobigny, to write another play from the, the improvisations. And he wrote Gaia Global Circus, which is actually a text that you can find published in English, I think, in the Yale Theater Journal, I think mm -hmm. it's, it's available. Us, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so it, it, is, it, it, <clears throat> it, it became a text. But what is important to me is that it was for three years, a research process and an improvisation process with lots and lots of versions. And to tell you the truth, it was very difficult. It was very interesting, but it was very difficult because again, I, my, my experience with theater were much more traditional. Uh, it was like, you know, you're staging Beckett, which is difficult enough, but you know where you come from. With the Gaia Global Circus play, we, we realized that we needed to invent the way of doing as we, as we were um, advancing in the question, so to speak. Um, so yes, a lot of improvisation and also um, uh, having the actors as part of the process very much. They were researchers with us. They were following the process with us. And we learned a lot all together. Half of them became vegetarian in the process. One of them was a climate skeptic at the beginning, and now everything he does is about, uh, you know, cli the, 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 the climate change and, and, and biodiversity. And so we were completely changed by the, by the process. And just to answer you about the circus, the circus is just a title. And that was a title that Bruno wanted because he liked the idea that um, we were like, in a, in a state of, of dazzlement of, we were a bit lost and he wanted to give the feeling of, uh, in French, maybe the circus is clearer, le, le cirque, a, a big, big mixture of feelings, of figures, of tones as well, because it was both tragic and, com and a kind of comedy. And I think that was important for us that it was not only you know, a climate play with, you know, fear and, and, and problems and, and um, so, yeah, it was a lot about our contradictions also as humans, our, our own contradictions and how we are inhabited by, um, by, by, by a variety of, of, uh, of reactions, of emotions. And you still perform it or? No, no, no. We performed it for three years. And yes, what I wanted to say that then to me, even that format, even that, that form was not in a way 
uh, completely, I don't know how to say that, adjusted to the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the next form we made with Bruno was even more difficult to, more difficult to describe. It's what you mentioned, the Théâtre de Négociation, a theater of negotiation. And that was very interesting because so different. It was 200 students gathered in Nanterre Amandier, in this huge theater, you, you know, uh, and they were trying to, to do an, an, um, a climate negotiation for one week, but not only humans were invited. We, we decided that the, the delegation would be delegations of, you know, animals, endangered territories. So we just opened up completely the, the principle of the, of the negotiation. And that was very interesting for me because nobody knew what we were doing. And it was difficult, very difficult to give it to a name. Was it a performance? What is, was it a, a, a model United Nation? You know, this kind of moon that people do at Harvard? Not really, because we were not following the, the, the norm. We were inviting animals and, 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 and different, uh, different entities. Was it a simulation? Was it a exhibition? Uh, some journalists said that it was the most interesting exhibition in Paris because you could visit it. Was it a thought experiment? I think it was a kind of thought experiment in, in, the, in the old sense of the world. What if we invited um, animal and uh, human entities around the table? What if we would give a voice to different kinds of, of agencies, again, to go back to our discussion. So you see, it's, it was a very different way to use the theatrical space because it was not only one room, it was the whole theater. Nanterre Amandie is huge. You have gardens, you have Chéreau work workshop where he was doing his films. Uh, you have two huge um, stages, you have the, the hall, everything was occupied by Philippe Ken uh, set design. So it was completely crazy. So, and after that, I thought, okay, that was interesting, but a bit heavy to carry. Um, and there was also lots of problems with the idea of reinvesting a political form, you know, the negotiation, it's a very strict form. And in fact, I didn't feel completely at ease with it. And I thought, okay, now Bruno, we have to move again. We have to change and to find something else. And I suggested that it could be interesting to have Bruno on stage. And that was again, a very big move because, uh, and I think I join you here on the idea of performing knowledge. What does that mean to perform knowledge? What does that mean to to do something which is not only a, a kind of illustration of knowledge, but which is really um, I, what I wanted to do with the first of one, the first uh, performance I did with with Bruno was to sh to share with the with the audience the pleasure I have in discussing with him, and the fact that exactly like in the case of Pasteur Theatre of Proof. When you listen to Bruno Latour, it's theatrical in the best sense of the world, of the word, which means it's um, uh, thinking alive. And I wanted to share that. Um, so I thought, okay, what should I do? Uh, and I had a very, very simple idea, and that became Inside, the show Inside, was to put Bruno inside his own PowerPoint, because he makes PowerPoint not very nice ones, but he makes PowerPoints, like academic do PowerPoints when he gives conferences. And I thought, okay, let's, let's make a PowerPoint that becomes something like a space, like a theatrical space in which he can actually move and, and, and he, in which he can actually describe to us the thinking he's doing at the moment. And the thinking he was doing at that moment was to, uh, try to change our point of reference. He said, okay, we think we live on a globe. 
it's again the Earth, the Gaia problem, again and again, staged in different ways, so to speak. So he said, okay, we think we are on Earth, on the globe, but in fact, we live in this very tiny critical zone, that's the word the scientists use, which is another way to say Gaia. Mm -hmm. and it 10 meters from... above the Earth, 10 meters below the Earth, right? Exactly, exactly. <clears throat> and everything happens there. So we are not on something, we are in something, we are inside this, this thing. So for me, it was an absolutely fascinating stage problem. Again, scenic question. What does that mean to be in something? And and again, it was an, another way to, re, to restate the question of what can theater do to help us feel um, this, this shift. And it's not really a shift of point of view. It's, it's deeper than that. And that's why I'm not sure I, 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 I managed to do it at all. That's why I need to continue to do theater because, because I failed many, many times. My feeling is that, in a way, all those experiments are somehow failures. You know, you you try something and you and you feel it's not exactly that yet. So, but what was interesting with the inside performance is that we, uh, I I tried to uh, share with the audience this shift of perception, this shift of feeling which is not only intellectual, which is not only optical. The problem is not only how do you represent the earth. The problem is how do you stand in a world which is as complex, as entangled as the scientists, the earth system scientists tell us. How do we welcome, so to speak, this this change of, of vision. So you see why it's very close to Galileo. You know, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a deep change of cosmos in the sense of it's a change of perception and understanding and feeling of where we stand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, um... And perhaps that is the most significant uh, reminder art and science uh, can do at the moment to decenter planet Earth from just the human experience, which seems to be um, egomanically at the center and, um, and to understand that it is a complex system. And we ourselves might be part of a much complexer system, like bodies and ourselves. They don't really know that they are cells, but they exist, but they do something together. and. Uh, and to find a way, as you said, to really experiment. And what you describe is an experiment. Everybody says we do experimental theater, but it's not just about rewriting the third act or temporary changes in timeline. But what you did is an uh, experiment in a, in a sense of, uh, as you said, or wrote that artwork is a think work. Like what you art doing art is thinking. And, what you see on the stage is a representation of thinking of a brain. And Bogart, who was here also on the talk, talked about that. That is a way of making the invisible thoughts and things that govern us are, uh, are possible. So it's really, um, I think, uh, um, a stunning um, discovery and also uh, what normally puts the fear in uh, every audience member to say, um, oh my God, it's play about science or something, and I have to learn something. But know that you. So there's something fascinating. It's connected. It's both um, theater. I loved your your, your installations in in uh, Amandier in in in, uh, out in Montel and uh, there are examples. I think in opera in Italy, just put plants in every seat because they we can't have humans. We put uh, they is the photo you see and I saw these, that. Yeah. We, we are connected uh, yeah. to that. There's the famous cat concerto of a Czech composer who filmed his cat that was playing on the piano. And he had the video of the cat in once and he composed something around it. It also made, made me think Eugenio Barba, who also gave a great uh, Siegel a talk here today. He recently had the blessing of a horse in a church, like an actor of a French company works where he came in 
with the priest. She was in a costume standing on it, but then she bowed down. So um, it is uh, incredible. But did it work? What, what happens? What, does the audience come? Are they as much changed as you did? I mean, it's incredible to say that you're actually the most you would hope for, yet your company members changed. But did audience, how did the audience react? And what audiences are you looking for? Yeah. Actually, I think it really depends on which project we, we discuss. Um, so the, the Gaia Global Circus, again, was very changing for the, for the people of the company. And we had some interesting reactions from the audience where we performed, when we performed in, in Canada, in, in, in New York, in Berlin. Um, but in a way, it was still very political kind of questions, question like, um, do you think we can do something for the climate, you know? So to me, those reactions prove that we were not completely at the level of um, deep change, so to speak. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. And then what happened with the theater of negotiation, it was in, in 2015, so a few years after, is that uh, it was again deeply changing for the people who participated in. That was a bit more than four actors. It was 200, 300 students, so it's a bit more. But I think we failed in the sense that it was very difficult for the people outside of the experience the people who were just visiting, so to speak, the negotiation, it was very difficult for them to realize that, you know, how disruptive it was to actually make politics by taking seriously the non-humans. So that was extremely strong for the students who did that. And now all of them, I'm pretty sure, work for those questions. Mm -hmm. So and participation is at the center. You think. Yes, exactly. Participation and immersion. And I would say that for the two other shows, so the one with Bruno Latour alone on stage, strangely enough, the reaction was much more powerful because of course you have a philosopher talking on stage, but the way in which I try to, to you know, to, to stage him, is that he doesn't have the typical position of a philosopher giving a lecture. You can hear his voice and he doesn't, sp he speaks on the microphone so very softly and he's completely lost into the set design. So basically what he's talking about is much more visible than what that himself. And it's also because it's always improvised those lectures, that there is a general frame, arc, narrative arc, if you like, but it's really, it's not read and it's not um, memorized, it's improvised. And that's very important because it means that the people can feel that something happens in front of them, which is live thinking. I don't know, as, as you say, live acting, there is live thinking mm -hmm. and, uh, and I think this has a peculiar power. I'm not sure I know why, but live thinking is something you can see the thinking happening in front of you and you enter into it. And as you said, because it's not about an intellectual discourse, but it's about change of, of feeling, change of position, change of perception, change of our relationship be, between our species and other species, our, understand, our understanding of our spatial relations, because it's about all that, it's much more, um, I would say, what happens in, 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 in theater at that moment is not what happens in a lecture hall where you have maybe the same conference being said. There is something specific about we all know that, that's why we do mm -hmm. theater, but there is a, a, a specific power of uh, the theater space, a kind of absolute space that makes the fact of performing knowledge on it um, uh, really, really moving. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And, and that was the topic of the other one, moving us. And it was very important for me that the, this last performance with Latour was about the link between, as we discussed before, the, the moving earth of Galileo and the moving earth of Lovelock, but also the moving of each person. The fact that it's, um, it has to be somehow an internal, an intimate movement to reconsider our relationship to, uh, to, to, to all the other living beings. Um, and, and, and also, yeah, uh, just to go back to the virus, the next show we are trying to, to devise, to imagine at the moment, is something about, the, um, um, uh, again, the very um, um, physical, material aspect of this virus. The fact that he goes for, from one mouth to another. This virus doesn't, this virus needs our bodies, but uh, politics also needs our bodies and ideas and thinking also needs our bodies so it's it's a um, it's a kind of warning it's also it's a kind of a reminder of how um you know in incarnate we are i don't know if you can say that in english yeah, yeah, yeah. embodied how embodied, embodied we are and and how um embodied the ideas are and how embodied the the politics also is. Um, so yeah, sorry, I think I was... No, 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 not at all. <clears throat> I think it is, it is so significant uh, what you are creating also with Latour. I think the idea of rejoining that marriage of arts and science, which in the 17th century, there was no great uh, real confusion about you could be an artist, but you're interested in science or the scientific instruments looked like artworks. And, um, and that there was um, a connection, but slowly, as you said, perhaps the, the, um, the, the nature of the observable world um, then um, divided itself from um, the artistic expression, which was then highly individual. I think uh, the, um, the great contribution that you, you really make in putting thinking and the process of thinking in a radical way on stage as an answer to our time where we need some guidance, uh, we need meaning, and we also need perhaps reminders. I think this is a, a, a significance and not the karaoke system as, a, um, as the theater perhaps has been functioned for a long time. Milo Rao used that word, uh, that it's time to change that. What you do there and experiment with is, uh, I, of, I think, of real, um, real significance. The, the time of Corona, I, I guess you also were in Paris at home, you had to print out permissions to go out. Yeah. Did it add an additional level to your work, do you think, because of this, something will be different, something will, you will approach things differently, or will it reinforce of saying what we did somehow was already on the right track? It's a difficult question because I don't know how you feel, but I feel we are very much plunged into it and I must say I was very uh, I, I was very surprised and, and, and I admired very much all those French thinkers and not only French but all over the world all the people who were producing thinking during that time because I thought oh how do they manage because for me you know it was first of all it was just a, a, a big stop um, so it that, that's why I'm not sure I will be very articulate in, in, in giving a, a strong answer to, to your question, but uh, for sure it has changed everything. Uh, I don't know exactly yet how far and how deep it has changed things. Um, it's, it's very strange because in a way it's, um, it's, a, it's a big stop uh, it was very interesting and 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 also terrible to 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 have to stay at home, to be stuck, to have no almost no body. Again, the body was was very strongly blocked, and and like everybody else in the world, I was trying to do a little bit of yoga or something just just to feel alive. So it was a big stop, and it was also very interesting to to have to stop. 
Um, and, and at the same time, I felt that it was an accelerator because it, it accelerated some of the things we were feeling. It accelerated the idea of, a, of fragility, of precarity, of entanglement. Um, and it, it, uh, it, made, it made visible lots of things in a way. We were discussing the power of, of stage for, for you know, making things visible but I'm, I'm very impressed by the power of Corona to make things visible, to make, you know, inequalities visible, uh, to, to make inequality, gender inequality, race inequality, um, um, of course, social inequalities, extremely visible. And in a way, um, even more disgusting than before you know, even more difficult to accept. Um, and and uh, it's, it's maybe a, a chance. And I don't know how to process that in my mind, but I'm very, very struck by the fact that uh, it's also the moment when, you know, the, 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 the scandal of, of, of the death of, of Floyd appeared and was so viral around the world you know it's it happens now um i don't know if it's really by coincidence you know as if the the corona helps us in a way i mean it kills all of us and it it's monstrous but it helps us to see the kind of uh, horror of 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 our lives and it forces us it forces us to look into it um Eyes in eyes, I would say in French, les yeux dans les yeux, um, and it's it's very hard, but uh, but it's also um, um, a good moment for that. And of course, it will change everything for for thinkers, for for artists. But I can't exactly yet tell you what it will change. I think it's it's too it's too much our present. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's scary. You mentioned earlier on the extinction of the species, you know, which might, there might be speculations, but now there is a hint of reality um, to it. You're right. You're right. Well, you, when you read, uh, th that was this big book by, by Clive Hamilton, this Australian philosopher. I think it was published in, in 2008 or something like that. And, and the title is terrible, Requiem, Requiem for Species, you know, you, you read that in, in, at the beginning of, of, the, of the years 2000 and you think, oh, he exaggerates and all that. But now you read that and it, it doesn't have the same sound. It, have, it hasn't, suddenly it's, it's, it's in our landscape. Yes. It's in our mind, you're right. Um, and and it, it's terrible, but at the same time, it's interesting because as I, as I just said, it's, it's impossible to, to look somewhere else. It's, in, it's impossible nowadays to, to pretend it doesn't exist. Yeah, it's a big crash of a car, of a train, of a plane. You have to look okay. at it. You, you have cannot. to look at it. Uh, look away, and we're coming closer, you know, to, to the end of the talk, next to a love lock or, uh, of course, um, Latour. What do you read or listen to? What inspires you? What, what, where do you say, what kept your, kept your motor warm as some of our... Uh, <laughs> I could show uh, you my... <laughs> yeah, please do, show. Get it, get it, yes. I, uh, I have books everywhere. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So at the moment, I'm, what I'm reading, I'm reading... It's very strange. I'm reading Descartes. Uh -huh. I'm reading Science en scène. I'm reading all oh, this beautiful book, Cartes et figures de la Terre. It's it's an amazing book about maps and 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 it it was a, a Beaubourg exhibition some some mm -hmm. years ago, and it's a beautiful catalog. I'm also very fond of Kirche, Le Théâtre du Monde. You know the Theatre mm -hmm. Mundi. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm also at the moment reading Tim Ingold. This is next to my bed, you see. 
Uh -huh. And I also read, you know, you've got all my bed here. You've got yeah. Underland. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, very, very interesting also about um, the soil, the soil on which we are, uh, the soil on which we live, and, and why, um, yeah, uh, why we tend to forget things we put in the soil, you know, the, the um, uh, les déchets, I don't know how you say that in English, the rubbish, mm -hmm. but also the, death the dead people, but also the, the roots, you know, uh, the, so Enderland is something quite interesting. And then you have all my little uh, anthrop Anthropocene library here with a lot of Lovelock and a lot of Baptiste Morizot. Um, but Bacon. as I told you, what? Bacon. I Bacon, saw. yes, you saw Bacon. Yeah, you're right, you saw Bacon. <laughs> And, and also always this link between laboratory and theater. That's a very serious uh, book, Scenes of Knowledge in the 17th century. So you said all that is entangled, but I also love, I also love that, you know, the Richard Powers overstory. And it's a mixture of theater, history of theater, history of knowledge, you know, theater and encyclopedia. But I, during the, oh, and of course I should mention Brecht, a lot of mm -hmm. there's a lot of wash but i was reading a lot lynn margulis during mm -hmm. the lockdown because uh she's the one who who wrote microcosmos and also mm -hmm. um l'univers bactériel yeah and 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 she, she, i find i find her so fascinating you know i read a lot of science because <coughs> what i like in science Mm -hmm. is not is 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 what i like with 17th century science as well it's it's full of wonder it's full mm -hmm. of stories it's full of actors um and all the things i i had been told in 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 college about how boring science is and how different it is from from literature and poetry and theater and all the things i love I discovered it's wrong. It's, I mean, it's it wrong. depends, yeah, it depends yeah. the kind of science you read, of course, but um, I, I, what I like in science is, is, is the wonder, is, is the surprise, is the passion, and is the curiosity of it. And again, I think that's one of the reasons why we met with Bruno Latour, is that we met, yeah, 15 years ago, and, and, and we could feel that both of us, we were fascinated by science and we loved it, um, not as a rationalist, you know, device, but as, as one of the ways in which the wonders of the world is being told. Yeah, that's amazing. I often go back to Alexander von Humboldt, the great yeah. discoverer of nature, and he was friends with Goethe, many argue, Goethe's Faust is actually based on Humboldt. They studied together, they visited each other in Weimar. And when Humboldt told him, I'm gonna to go to South uh, America, which he thought was the center of the earth, everything would come from there, but perhaps we know a little bit more, it might be Africa. But, uh, uh, and he said, I'm gonna catalog everything and bring the plants. And Goethe said, yeah, you can give Latin names and you can order all the stones in alphabetical order. How will you communicate what nature is about? To be alive is about the sunset on the, extinct volcano and it made him think and he became the first travel journalist who, who described the experience of nature as part of it and also then did his famous drawings where he organized flowers according to the height of a mountain and said they have more to do with each other from Tibet or the Dolomites than with a, a kilometer a thousand meters below so it became a completely new idea also coming out of that experience and I think you really are reconnecting something with Latour that is of extreme importance for the theater performance world and we all heard why we have to engage with these themes also in a bigger frame and a, as you said earlier you look out of a window and you see a tree but be aware that what you look through the frame already has been done so it's not just about writing a play about arts and science but you know maybe take the frame out like Joseph Boyce who made holes in the in the walls of his academy and got fired. But I think that's what you are doing. You are reframing this and also telling us in that sense. And it's interesting to hear from you that you think we are at such a pivotal moment again, uh, like in the 17th century. And uh, so, um, and the idea of the bedazzlement, what Sylvain Guillot writes about, who also runs TDM, that time I 
and theater and media in, at Harvard, um, who also suggested early on, we should talk to you next to Thomas Oberander from the Berlin Festspiel, who was working with you on the Immersion Festival and do an exhibition. And he talked about you and uh, Latour and said, how can we do an climate change exhibition, but we have our climate uh, control working, the air conditioners on. We are against uh, getting nuclear energy, but we use the energy that you're trying. How can you change an institution that for the moment is believe that window we look at the work, work is changed. So thanks uh, to, to, to all of them, also to suggesting you. I think it's extremely significant, important, interesting, and a new way of uh, looking at things and everybody who works in theater. You know, you can connect it with your own research and your own traditions, but there is something in there and perhaps you really do have answers in the form you found for the time we live in to give meaning and to understand where we come from, where we are, and where we are going to. And we really do need answers and we need new forms. That will be highly interesting what you're doing. And I'm sorry you didn't come to New York and uh, could do it. Maybe like Walt Whitman, I just read that his Leaves of Grass, he wrote it as a young poet. But then he continued working his entire life till he died on versions of it, made it longer and shorter. So maybe your Gaia Global Circus could be something you just keep the name and you rework it. And uh, maybe one day with real acrobats, we have big circus fans also, and there's great work done with the body, also by these great institutions uh, that uh, promote uh, circus work, which also I think is trying to reframe it. And there's so much uh, to discover. It's a, a wide field. Um, as Ackermann said, so really, really, really thank you for taking uh, that uh, Siegel Talk so serious and sharing your experience. And we could go on or we could have many, many sessions. And perhaps you should put online your NYU session, restage them with your students and everybody can, uh, can see them. Yeah, I'm, I'm serious. And uh, that might be something before we leave and go. And we ask that to our uh, uh, guests. And I know it's a big question, but if you're a young artist or young researcher, and also our audience at home, what is your advice? What's important? What should they focus on? How to use it? And is that the outlook? To it? What meaning can we make of this time? It's such a difficult question that I'd like to reverse it. Because you know, the advice to a young artist is a, is a genre. Almost. Yeah, yeah, from Rilke on. And that, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And, and what I find fascinating with our time is that I would, lay, I'd, I would like to take advice from them. I think there is something absolutely uh, new happening in the order of generation and also in the wisdom. And it might be, it might seem strange, but I, I feel old already, you know, I'm, I'm 42 and I feel that I have so much to learn from all those young people who are going on the streets, for all those young artists who are doing, you know, Extinction Rebellion, rebellion from all those people uh, with whom I work and, and they are so, you know, strongly feminist, um, uh, anti-racist, they are so strongly engaged, political, you know, much more than my generation was, um, that I, I, I wouldn't give them <laughs> any advice, except that please teach us, the older generations, to, to share with you what, what you see, what you do. Well, this is a, <clears throat> a, a, a significant advice to listen for that next generation that will be here when we are no longer here. And that in a way, as you said, keep the living species going by being alive, by the virtue of being alive, um, with the, the planet, planet is alive. Frederick, really, thank you again. And I hope one day you will come uh, to the Siegel uh, uh, Center and we will see uh, your work. And, yeah. um, and uh, we are going on uh, this week with uh, our Siegel Talks. Tomorrow we hear from Iman Own from Palestine, who runs the Ashtar Theater, and to hear how, how does that feel like in the time of Corona, next to all the other complex uh, layers of difficulties, uh, whether it's 
social, political, economically. Um, uh, what how is that for, for her? And on Friday we hear from the English-speaking Caribbean. After we heard from uh, Martinique already and Haiti, um, we have uh, Sakina Dia and Ivone Walters from Jamaica who will um, talk um, about this. We are working on like, next year's next week's lineup also. So um, thank you for staying. The talk today also showed why it is so significant. Uh, to listen to uh, artists, performers, and researchers, scientists, something that bridges, as we say, at the Siegel Academia and professional theater, international and also American theater. So you're right in the middle um, of what we do. It's inspiring, it's new, it's something that hasn't been done before. And you're not, as an artist, copying the image that you see in a museum. So you do your own new one with all, as you said, how difficult it really is and how much part of it is um, a failure. And, uh, but this is uh, um, um, the greatest work I think one, one can do. So thank you again. I hope we didn't steal too much of your time from you and your family and that we will have a, a good dinner in, uh, in Paris and ninth arrondissement, where are you? I'm in Belleville. I'm in the tents. Oh, just... you're in the Belleville. Uh, yeah. Wonderful. That's a you great, come live, mixed, diverse yeah. neighborhood. Yeah. Yes, and so what's exactly. for dinner in Paris tonight? I have no idea. I will find out. We will find out. You make an experiment. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you for listening. Thank and uh, really, this is all for you, uh, the listener, to make a difference also in your life. There might be something in there that changes or saves your life. And what you hear here, it's important to have good performances and the art but it's important to have a great audience that also applies what Frédéric does in her work. Do it at your home, the experiment, find out, read, uh, create uh, uh, connections. And I think this is what this is all about. It's no longer that we watch master artists. It is a call to action. It's a call to change ourselves. And it has to be, as Frédéric also said, an authentic change and then uh, it'll help to change the world. Thanks for HowlRound again, for hosting us at uh, Travis and, uh, Thea and uh, the great VJ and uh, my Siegel team, Sanyang and Andy. And I hope to uh, see you all um, again and hear from you again um, from our audience uh, tomorrow and uh, next week. So stay safe and stay tuned. And uh, au revoir, Frédéric. Thank you. And uh, au revoir. Bye bye. Merci bye, bye. bye bye.